All right. Let us begin. Have we started? Have we started? Have we started? This should be live. All right. Finally. Let us begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to BHT Studios. That took me 45 minutes to finally get live. Um, I'm going to just wait. I don't see any comments at all, which is unusual. So I'm going to just wait to see until I get a little bit more than zero comments. And then we will uh, continue on. Here we go. 1080 is on. I can hear you. Very good. Hey, Boris. How's it going? Hey, Ian. Uh, do I, did I find... That I finally figured it out. Good gracious. Finally, I'm set up here. Ah. 15 minutes of high stress. Thanks for joining. HD, finally. Yeah, what I did was um, I just basically, there's a way where YouTube lets you um, use your previous settings and everything's all set. And uh, I made sure I was not in low latency, which I did last week. So I just started from scratch, which then realized, oh, I'm using the wrong thumbnail. Oh, I'm using the different um, key, the streaming key. So that's what took me a little bit longer. So thanks for joining. I've probably lost quite a few people now because of uh, this uh, delay, but uh, good to be here. Um, I was going to show a few things here. Uh, before answering any questions, looking good? Excellent, thank you. So thanks everyone, Martin and Colin and OC2Fish07, Boris, Michael. Hey, Michael, have, have you gotten um, burnout yet from from Clubhouse? I kind of got burnt out, but I'm also been busy as well. I'm gonna just share with you something, just one second. So you guys, you guys know I've been um, testing um, I've been testing, I got bags sent to me and this is, I get a lot of questions about this bag here. This is the Chrome Cadet. Now this was a, a limited edition uh, model. So uh, this, you can't get it with this leather in the front, but they just came out with a mini cadet and I'm getting a lot of people asking me questions about it. So this is the mini right here, the smaller, and this is, I think maybe a limited edition color. So you can sort of see the size difference like the mini can easily fit inside the regular cadet right it just it fits inside and there's like room to spare in here but this is the mini cadet and I just shot a video with camera girl yesterday um, and I haven't produced it yet because I have a Fuji love article due um, I have a Fuji love article due tonight and so even me doing this live I kind of said to camera girl I said she's teaching piano right now and I said you know what I, um, maybe I'll just skip live this week. I think my followers would understand. And then she basically said to me, like, you know, when you make a commitment, um, just do it. And on top of that, she's like, and by the way, Sunday's beginning of the week. She's being super technical. You know, like a lot of calendars, most calendars in North America, and I think Western Europe, it's Sunday's beginning of the week, which I think is a kind of a historical Judeo-Christian thing, like Saturday's the Sabbath. So Sunday's beginning of the week, whatever it is. To me, a beginning week is Monday because, anyways. So, um, so this is the the mini cadet, and you're wondering like how much stuff can it hold? Well, I'll show you. So it can hold the XE4 easily on the side here, like that, and that's the XE4 with the grip, the, with the thumb thumb rest as well as the hand grip. And it can hold uh, a, a film point and shoot. This is the uh, 35Ti. Or you can throw in, like here I have the Ricoh GR3. That'll fit inside. And a third point and shoot here, which is the uh, the Olympus here with the, the, the flash on here. The XA. And it fits the DOP kit. Just a regular DOP kit in here. And then in the front zippered section here, it's just like a you can slip stuff in. So this is my little pack with uh, extra cables, e ear pods, uh, AirPods will fit in here, and then I have a little change pouch here, and a strap. It's a Clever Supply strap that, that fits onto the uh, XE4, 
And this is a Zade, Zade made um, battery holder for the um, XE4. And all that fits inside this little, little sling that you wear. Wear it like this on your back. Like this, and then you can just kind of quickly pull this like this and swing it around front. And I said in a previous post, like the, you can use this as the front carry. I know some people this is weird to carry it on the front, but you can do front carry if you wanted to, or you can have it back carry like this, or you can have it side carry like this if you wanted to carry it on your side. And so, anyone asking, like, you know, how much stuff can you fit inside something like this? You can fit actually quite a bit, all right? So hopefully that answers all the questions about that. And then I'm gonna now go to, so that's the one thing I wanted to share, I think, the one main thing I wanted to share. And then now I'm gonna try to get to your questions here. Um, still getting that weird little leap thing here. So let me just try to, um, hey Al, how's it going? Ali, Ali Shad Shadpur. Yes, burned out for sure. Yeah, dude, Michael, you were, uh, Michael's from uh, York Photo in Pennsylvania or on Instagram, it's it's retro underscore photo underscore York. So go follow him. I'm gonna try to have uh, Michael on live, on, on, Inst on YouTube live. I think I figured out a way of using Signal, the, the, like a text messaging app sort of, like WhatsApp basically, right? Use Signal and then do a screen grab with screen grab audio and then be able to do live uh, YouTube with someone using Signal. I think I can make it work. And so I'm gonna have Michael on, but if not, um, just follow Michael anyways on Instagram because he's got, for all you film nerds that are always asking me film nerd questions, the fact that, I don't know, Michael, how long you're gonna stay on for, but if he stays on long, if you just ask him a question in the comments, I'm sure he can answer it way better than I can. Um, Boris saying, as part of the 75 to 80% of non-Apple phone users, yeah, there was a trick of using it on an iPad, right? By getting the invitation and then trick, and then going on iPad. I've not, I've not tried Clubhouse. Feel like I'm not missing much. Yeah, I mean, it depends on, just like Twitter or Instagram or even YouTube, depending on what corner of the app you live in, some, like I know some people are already saying that they're gonna use it for their teams to get together and do little meetings and beers and cameras have tried to do some of their live meetups. Uh, like they were using Zoom, but sometimes Zoom is like an extra layer of, I, I, I compared Zoom versus um, Clubhouse to like email versus text messaging. They both kind of do the same thing, but the feel of email seems a little bit less fluid and natural versus text messaging. And same thing, like Zoom just seems more like an, um, I don't know how to explain. Like Clubhouse feels like an app. Easy to get in, the interface is reasonably easy, and it feels like versus Zoom, you need a, a password, and you need like a, the code and then the password and then lot, everyone wants to be on video. So I like the premise of Clubhouse. It's just a matter of, it's only as good as the people that create the communities within it, right? I think that's the, the strength or the weakness of Zoom. If there's really cool little, kind of like Reddit, if like a subreddit, if there's little cool clubs and little groups that are made for specific people, either private or public, I think it can work out really well. Like even if you are, let's just say, someone has a, a creator has a Patreon account and say, hey, let's meet up once a week or they do two or three times a week uh, Q&A on Clubhouse. I think that works. I even saw someone who was like a, a mental health uh, doctor who wanted to do like a once a week show on, on Clubhouse and she had just said that that felt more natural for her and I think there was like, 2,500 or 3,000 people on uh, listening to her. And she's like, it's almost like doing a radio show, but a lot, a lot less complicated, right? So I know, I think there's a lot of potential for it. Um, another little jump there. Sorry, guys, I got to back up a little bit. We are live. Here goes anyone else. Who's Fred Smith? 
B&H helped him out and all, but come on. Uh, Reginald Esque, Esque, Reginald Esque. Yeah, I don't even know who Fred Smith is. Is he like a ambassador for B&H? Um, let me see here. Oh, someone's asking about XE4 lenses. What other than the 27 pancake that could come as a kit? I would recommend two lenses. And that's one of the things I'm going to actually maybe share with you now. Let me just set up the screen here. Um, this is where I need to break off the chat here. Let me just say pop out chat. Here we go. And then I'm going to put the chat in the corner here so I can read it down here. All right. And then I'm going to open up Flickr. Just, just be patient with me, guys. As I kind of move around here, I'm going to just set up the screen just so I can show you why I recommend the, either the 35 F2 or the 23 F2. The, the F2.7, as long as, as long as there's lots of light, and I'm going to show you an example here. Okay, so here's Camera Girl, and I'm going to now switch over to Window Grab and we Webcam. Here we go. So you guys see this, right? So here's Camera Girl. I don't know how to get rid of that top bar there. But when when the weather is nice, and not going to even... Here, let me just... Um, what am I doing here? Yeah, and you can see how sharp this is, right? Quite a sharp image. Um, I'm going to just back out. You could see, oh, where's taken on, where's all the, um, there should be XF data. I don't know why there's no XF data here. Uh, uh, let me just, back to album. So stuff outdoor like that is fine. Now I'm going to use an example of indoor. Okay. I don't know why all the XF data is missing though. This is the... I bumped this up to ISO 3200, okay, and it was about 30th of a second. I don't know why this is struggling here. I'm just trying to go to the next picture. I don't know why it's not. Usually there's little arrows that let me go to the next picture. And then um, the next picture is blurry. See that? So I basically did a flurry of shots. Like I did like click, 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 like four shots in a row. And both ha might have to do with my stabilization, but also my subject is moving a little bit. So you get these little bit out of blurry pictures all the time. And so then I decided to switch over to the XF35 F2, okay? And first of all, the lens is sharper already. The 35 F2 over the 27 F2.8, it's a sharper lens. I was able to drop down to ISO 1600 because it's one stop faster, right? Or I can have it at the same ISO and have twice the shutter speed, like twice as fast. So instead of a 30th of a second, I'm getting a 60th of a second. So I found out for myself that basically when I'm in an indoor environment like this, when I'm indoors, pictures like this work out way better when you have f2 i found f2 point again like when you're outdoors like this uh f2.7 uh f2.8 is fine in fact i think for this shot no this was at f2.8 um oftentimes i stopped on the f5.6 because i wanted a bit of depth of field but for when once you go indoors i find it's a struggle with the the f2.8 so i i mean i like the fact that this lens is so is so compact Right, it's so thin, it's so compact. But if you're doing indoor stuff, I think really having like even stuff like this when I was with Camera Girl, um, like you know, like this was fine because you can see there's a lot of light. You can see I'm she's gonna kill me because I'm coming in so close. But you know, you can see how how sharp you can get the uh, wide open at f 2.8. I still don't know why I didn't get any XF data. That's really weird. Um, but anyways, so long story short, I'm not a fan of the XF27 F2.8 other than if you want everything really sharp. Did I say that right? No. It's a reasonably sharp lens, 
It has the same weaknesses as the 23 F2, where up close it's not that sharp. And like from medium distances like this, it's it's very it's re like look how sharp that is, right? It's a it's a sharp lens. I like how like the little eyes of the car is there. Let me just zoom out here. I still don't know why I can't scroll left and right either. What's happening here? Can't get the arrows. I can't get the arrows. Sorry guys, I'm not making this very exciting for you guys. Okay, let me just go back. I'm going to just try to catch up here. Hello, Taco. Um, okay, I'm going to let me make my screen bigger. I really need help doing these lives. These lives are tricky for me. I do have Cafe YVR as my moderator, so thank you, Cafe YVR. Um, and and the, and the comments keep on jumping. I know there's like a plugin that I can have it scroll one by one. Let me just see here. I don't want to miss any good questions either. Other lenses, I got that one. Nice to catch you live, Bora. I hope this time is good. And sorry for like the late notice, but like I said, Camera Girl had said you commit yourself to once a week. You should do it. But P.S. Sunday is already the beginning of the next week, so whatever, right? It's, to me, Sunday, this is still part of this week, and then tomorrow's the beginning of a new week, so that's the way I see it. John from Australia, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong, any new... Uh, hi, John from Perth, Austra Australia, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong, any news on... No news... No, I haven't talked to anyone in Hong Kong uh, in a long time. I have friends that work in and Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen, and they're fine. Uh, be that's because they have money, right? And uh, not so much money that, that they'd be bothered by the government. But uh, no, I haven't heard anything. If you mean like politically or economically, what's happening? No. I just keep in touch with um, uh, family, like my cousin, my wife's cousins and stuff like that, and it's just idle chatter, so I don't really know what's happening there. Looks pretty nice bag, carry think tank, but looks more stylish. Oh yeah, the um, where's the bag? Here we go. Oh yeah, and and you guys may have uh, uh, noticed I do have discounts at at um, at uh, Chrome Industries for all for anything that's not on sale. They've created a twenty percent discount, which is pretty darn good for like non sale items. Twenty percent. Just use the code Big Head Taco Twenty. And anything that's not on sale, you can't stack the discount. So if you have a discount code already from something else or you have a gift certificate, actually gift certificate should be fine. But don't quote me on that. But if it's on sale or discount, you can't use it. But anything regular price that you want, like right now this mini cadet is regular price. And I don't think, it might go on sale near the end of the season. But I think a bag like this might just sell out. A lot of this stuff sells out. Like for instance, the, the DOP kit, uh, all the colors are sold out. You can't even get the regular black one. And so for stuff like this, accessories, gloves, dop kits, things that barely or rarely go on sale, just use Big Taco 20. And it's not an affiliate link or anything. Like I'm not getting any kickback for it, but I usually try with uh, manufacturers if they can give me some kind of a discount code. And Chrome has given me discounts in the past and they gave me this one and I said, what's the expiry? And they said, for now there isn't one. And so just keep on using it until, so, you know, put stuff in your, in your checkout, type in the code. And if it works, then go for it. And if it doesn't work and you want to wait for a sale, well, then I guess just back out, <laughs> empty your checkout bag and then wait for a sale. Because, you know, a brand like Chrome, they have sales throughout the year, right? But that 20% is nice if you're going to buy something that rarely goes on sale, like their sneakers. Um, let me see here. Uh, ja uh, Jeff Kim, why didn't the X30 catch on? I think it had an unusual native ISO of 100. Also, resolution was perfectly fine for me. Yeah, the I, I mentioned it in a couple of the YouTube videos that I made for the X30. And I think I even wrote a couple of articles on my blog and maybe even on Fuji Love, which is at the time the X30 was out, they were competing against the Canon G7X and G5X and the Sony... RX 100 series. By that time, it was maybe on Mark II or maybe Mark III. 
And those were all one inch sensors. And the two thirds inch sensor was over a decade old. It was a quite an old sensor. Like a lot of the all in ones from the early 2000s, like the Nikon and the Minolta's and the, like, you know, it's like the zoom lens and the camera body was, it's like an all in one. Those all used two thirds inch sensor. It had been around for a long time. And so um, people wanted h higher uh, image quality, not necessarily just resolution. I think it was a 12 megapixel sensor. And I think the Sony's and the Canon's were around 12 to 16, but because the pixel density was less, it had better high ISO performance. And so that was the biggest uh, Achilles heel of the X30. And I had recommended to Fujifilm get the one inch sensor, but Fujifilm was holding on to that two third sensor. It was their last sensor. There was part of their, I think their X more line. It was their own proprietary. It had the X trans technology and it was being made in Fujifilm's own uh, sensor factory. And it was the last sensor that they were holding on to before switching everything over to Sony. So they went to Sony anyways. And so I had said, if the X30 had a one inch sensor, and of course, because of that, it would change the, the, the field of view of that uh, 28 to 120 zoom or 105 zoom, whatever the range was, I think it was 28 to 105 or so. Um, it would make it into something like a, you know, 38 to something else or something, would it go? Yes, it would go further out that way. They would have to redesign the lens and if they wanted a 28 to something and still have the F2 to 28 range, it would have to, they would have to limit the range to maybe 28 to 80 or something like that, but it still would have been optically superior to both the Canon and this, and the Sony, which the X30 did have. And so, yeah, I really like the X30. I thought it was a really cool camera and I have one in my studio here somewhere. I'm gonna just go find it. Just give me a second. I don't take too long looking for it, but I do have it here, somewhere in here. Here we go. I found it quickly. So here is the X30. I always thought this was a really cool camera. It turned on by zooming it and now it's turned on like this. It had a proper articulating screen, not a fully selfie articulating screen, but it was a proper articulating screen. It has a, I think it had an HDMI out. Yep, it had an HDMI out. It had a microphone in, remote in, and USB micro charge. And it was the first camera to get classic Chrome, even before uh, any of the interchangeable lens cameras. It has a um, pop-up flash here. And it's just a really nice size. So imagine a camera like this, one inch sensor. Um, this is the X100. So you could see, it's hard to tell in the video, they almost look the same size, but it's it's quite a bit, it's a quite a bit smaller. Not in terms of like depth, because of course you're getting a zoom lens on here. And of course I have the, the hood on the X100, but yeah, I always like the X30. Um, it's one of those cameras I wish they bring back, but that kind of segment, of the RX100, the G5X, that's such a shrinking market that I don't see anyone, I don't see Fujifilm bringing it back. If anything, they should bring back the X70 and make an X80. They would sell that better than something like an X30. But yeah, I always like the X30. Um, Boris asking, what do you think is the future of sub APS-C sensors? I've recently gone back to my old Nikon 1 camera for the use with C mount lenses. Really hope Micro Four Thirds can hang on for such purposes. Yeah, I mean, I think Micro Four Thirds might end up being a niche. I think everyone's waiting for the uh, Panasonic GH6 to see how much it is improved over the GH5, uh, which is a video format, right? It may end up becoming a video centric format. Uh, the Nikon One, which is funny you mentioned the Nikon One because uh, I have a buddy of mine here, Cafe YVR was with me at the time, uh, Roland, he had the um, his Nikon one, because someone stole his Canon RP, which is really weird, like he got robbed. Uh, something's weird, my Flickr app has frozen. So here is my buddy, Roland. He's such a a fun, quirky guy. And maybe, I mean, you know, he should be cool for me sharing this, these photos of him. He's an easygoing dude, loves his colors. Here we go, window grab. Right here, this is my buddy Roland. And I think I might be having some internet problems because the image is blurry. 
it must be having problems. Um, there we go. There, there is his Nikon one right there. I don't know what model of it. It looks like one of the higher end ones, but um, you know, Nikon just came out with a new one inch sensor. See, there's something wrong with Flickr. And also Sony just announced a new one inch sensor. So in terms of one inch sensor interchangeable lens, I don't think there's a need for it. Um, I think it's a great all in one type camera system. Uh, so point and shoots, maybe things like uh, not webcams, but like those action cams, as they try to put bigger sensors in there, maybe the one inch sensor would become like the premium premium. It'll be bigger than like the size of a regular GoPro, but if you wanted a high resolution, like maybe even for drone uh, videography, maybe one day it'll move up to the one inch sensor perhaps. Uh, Micro Four Thirds, I think it's a struggling format, especially with Olympus, um, you know, as a company being sold off to a Japanese, partly government controlled conglomerate to help struggling uh, industries, especially when there's uh, patent and proprietary technology information that they don't want it in the hands of foreign ownership. So the government basically stepped in and bought out uh, Olympus so they wouldn't go bankrupt. But then they separated the Micro Four Thirds camera part of their business. So um, if I was getting into photography, personally, like right now, I, I wouldn't buy Micro Four Thirds. It's just kind of risky, especially if you want to... And if you're getting into it, knowing that it may have an end life, but getting access to like really great lenses and bodies at dirt bottom end prices, then maybe. But if you want longevity, those are not... That's not the platform I think you should be getting into. That's my thoughts on, on um, Micro Four Thirds. I don't think it's a smart decision at this time to get into Micro Four Thirds, unless you're already in it and that's different. You're already invested, right? But if you're if you're new to it, um, I would um, think twice. And here we go. Here's Punk Rep Menonov. Can Rico Pentax fire whoever made the awful K1? Oh yeah, with the like the Robotech Macros uh, kind of the robotic. You know the funny thing is. It's weird for us, it might sell well in Japan, but then we know that the Japanese market is not the global market and they have the Galapagos thinking, the Galapagos conundrum in Japan where it does well in Japan, but not globally. It might even do well in South Asia, but for North America, yeah, it's a, it's a hideous camera, I must admit. Any news on Mint or Champagne Court? I really should reach out to both of them, but no news. Uh, I, I do talk to Mint every once in a while. Um, they're fine. Mint is doing good. Their, their sales are more global than it is local. So even if Hong Kong shut down, let's just say, Gary sells more cameras overseas than he does within Hong Kong. So um, he, he told me they're doing fine. But Champagne Court, I heard that because, you know, they're knocking that down. It's been on, in the works for the last four or five years. And I think David, Mr. David Chan said he was going to move across the street. But uh, I should just give him a call, shouldn't I? Or if anyone's in Hong Kong, let me know. Watch Hobbyist. I prefer podcasts to Clubhouse. Yeah, I mean, I know with some people, I know what you mean. With some people, like let's say you had the big guys like Elon Musk and Bill Gates on Clubhouse, those are tightly controlled um, conversations. You can't have like 800 people trying to talk to Bill Gates or Elon Musk, right? You have like maybe three or four, like maybe two moderators, four speakers, and you keep it to a limit. The beauty of of having uh, Clubhouse is that it's live, and some people, they do say they listen while they're driving, which is kind of neat, right? But I understand, like... I think it's remember it's still in beta as well. It's not even it's not even ready for the mainstream yet. So I think they'll find their way. Martin asking about the GR3 IQ versus the uh, X100V. They're both very good. If I had to choose one, because I like the 28 mil equivalent wide angle, I would pick the GR3, but not objectively i think subjectively i picked the the gr3 but the x100 is one stop faster 
even when you add the WCL, uh, a WLC X100, the wide angle converter to get the same 28 mil equivalent, but it's 28 F2, right? But I do like the stabilization on the Ricoh GR because I do a lot of night type photography. So uh, I would say, they're, I mean, they're both pin sharp, but it, it is harder to make a 28 mil lens than a uh, 35 mil equivalent. Like the wider you go from 50 mil, the more complicated the lens, and then the more telephoto you go from 50 mil, it becomes more and more complicated because you're starting to have to adjust for more either light bending this way with uh, with wide angle or bringing in light this way and then correcting it like that with uh, with telephoto lenses. But both super sharp. I I can go either way with the X100V and the Ricoh GR3, both from a sensor firmware and optical, the physical lens. I can go either way with uh, Fuji or Ricoh. The Ricoh has the IBIS, but then Fujifilm has a one-stop faster. So if you want that that bokeh for some things, you get it with the, with the Fujifilm. And I also do like the, the color is better from the Fujifilm, but the Ricoh has the positive film, which is really cool, but that's the only one that I really like. And then they have the high contrast black and white, which is cool for some things, but not for everything. So overall, in terms of profiles, I like the Fuji film, but it's a hit and miss. But you know, to be honest, I carry the Ricoh GR3 more with me everywhere I go, just because it's so tiny, right? Because if I'm carrying, like right now, I'm carrying the, the XE3, XE4 in my little um, chrome bag, but then, I mean, they're basically the same size. So I can't, I can carry both of these in that bag, but there's no point. So I can carry one or the other, but I always carry a little point and shoot with me like this, no matter where I go. And it's usually the Ricoh GR3. Um, first action, Kamen, what do I think of this uh, Sumerit line of the Leica lenses? I think it's great. I actually, I would, if I didn't need low light photography, which I do shoot a lot at night, I would 100% go with the Sumerits versus the Sumacrons because you pay a lot for this. I mean, the Sumerits aren't cheap either, but um, if with the 50 mil uh, 2 4 Sumerit, I say go for it. I think they're great lenses, great pricing as well. Um, I see that some are not questions. Uh, Bora saying there's some weird artifacts. Yeah, it might be because I'm going through OBS and OBS gives me warnings saying like there's some kind of a mis mismatch between the, the, the bit rate. I have to go in the back end and fix it. But uh, hopefully this is still better than last week. Last week was 480. Oh, and Reginald saying Fred Smith is the B and H ad that pre rolls before every video. Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't. I I have YouTube Red, which I pay for, and so I don't see any ads. So, oh, you mean that's embedded? Maybe I just I don't pay much attention. Let me just try. I'm gonna look for questions here. Uh, Dennis XE4 or GR3? Very different cameras. Um, you know, this is an interchangeable lens camera. That's the main reason why you would get something like this. So you can change out your lenses and the GR3, is just a little pocket point and shoot. But again, because the sensor and processor on the XE4 is the same as the X100, basically what I said about the X100 goes the same for this other than the, the lens image quality. Um, yeah, I mean, you'd get frustrated with the uh, GR3 if that was your primary camera because there's no EVF, the autofocus is really bad in low light, and when you need to manual focus, it's really bad because you're trying to manual focus off an LCD screen. There's a lot about this. This is like a, uh, this is like a, a little Miata, right? Or like a Jeep. It has a purpose, it's cool, like a little convertible vehicle, but it lacks a lot of the things that something like an SUV or a proper hard roofed vehicle has, you know, like, so that's what you're going to struggle with this. But if you need a convertible, you need something light, compact and powerful, then you go for the GR3. But there's a lot of compromises. You know, as you saw, I don't carry just the GR3 on its own. I have, uh, you know, something like this, uh, 
camera like this with me. Then I'll carry a GR3 as a backup and then also a little film point and shoot along with me as well. So it's never my primary camera unless, as I say, it's a wedding or a funeral or some kind of um, formal event where it's a little faux pas to carry a full-size camera. So I would bring the GR3, which fits on the inside of a suit or on the inside of a of a light, like a jacket or something like that. And it's it's just... It's such a convenient little point and shoot to carry around with you, but it's not a replacement for a proper um, full-fledged camera with your dials and EVF and you know an articulating screen. That's another weakness of the GR3. I hope that the GR4 will have an articulating screen, and I hope they bring back the flash, and I hope they bring back the exposure compensation toggle, which I don't know why they got rid of. Has Fujifilm shipped the XE4 anywhere yet? No, I don't. I think it's soon. I think the sales embargo was sometime in March. So I think retailers may be getting it now and should be selling very shortly. North America is usually the first market. Like Japan and North America usually gets it at the same time. So it should be soon, like within a couple of weeks. Photo foray as an older guy, I love their buckle. Takes me back to the old seatbelt. You talking about the chrome chrome bags? Yeah, I like it because it's it's slippery ish when you need to. But they do have the webbing though. If you mean if you're talking about the the chrome, this this part of it here does have a webbing, like a like a a sponge, and then this part here is more like a seatbelt. It's picking up on my eyes. It can't pick up on the strap. Anyways. Oh man, I must be really behind because people are still talking about Chrome. So I'm going to try to catch up here. I'm going to look for uh, cute questions here. Uh, still Storm Men ask from the Netherlands. Hello from the Netherlands. Do you think the Expo 2 will get a last Kaizen update of any of the new film simulations? Um, I don't think it's a priority for Fujifilm. So I would say no, because if the X-Pro2 got it, I would think that the X-H1 would also get it. And I think they, they deserve it. I think the X, I mean, if they include the X-Pro2, it would include the X-T, X -T, X -T2, X-Pro2, and the X-H1. Those three, I would love it if they did one final Kaizen update with the film simulations, but my guess is they won't do it. Now they did it with the x a uh, GFX 50S and the 50R, which actually has the same processor as the X-T2 and the X-Pro2 and the X-H1, which is the X-Processor Pro, third generation of that processor, but um, which means that they can do it. You know, like the, the processor and the firmware can handle it, but I have a feeling Fujifilm won't do it, which is a shame. And Bill saying he loves his X30. Yeah, I think it's really cool too. Bring it back. I mean, look at all the dials it still has, right? It has all the, it has a D-pad. It doesn't, it's, it is touch screen, but it doesn't have, touch screen, but it doesn't have a joystick. But this was one of the first of their, of this uh, lineup that they had both. They had both, uh, I mean, it pretty much has everything but a joystick, right? has a pop-up flash, it has a D-pad, articulating screen, built-in zoom lens. This is just a great camera. And it has that goofy, um, the cap, the same as the X100 series. Uh, I'd rather just get a regular, actually, can you put a lens cap on here? Yeah, I just threaded. So you can put a lens cap on here. Whatever thread it is, it doesn't tell you. It looks like some weird 39 mil or something like that, or 42 mil, but yeah, this is a cool little camera. I like it. It's a classic, a digital classic. Nikon 1V, Steel Matthews. Uh, you're talking about Roland's camera. Yeah. Man, I'm really behind. Oh, Ian's saying that my, my volume drops when I do an image grab. Okay, thanks for letting me know. It has something to do with um, OBS, I guess. Oh, you know what else? I'm probably doing wrong. Just give me a second, guys. I gotta, I gotta run an app here. Oh, I'm on performance mode. Hmm. 
Weird. Okay, well, we'll see how it goes. Micro Four Thirds, good for certain genres, for sure. Would you would you use a Canon mirrorless for street photography? For sure. Even if it's the M series with the APS-C sensor, although there's not a lot of lenses for it, but even the EOS R series, um, if there isn't a focal length that you like, you just get the adapter that lets you put the regular uh, E-mount, not E-mount, the regular um, EOS uh, DSLR mount and SLR mount lenses. You can put that on there. Um, yeah, for sure. The dual pixel autofocus is really good. And the, the Fuji, uh, the Canon colors are really nice. If you like the body and how it feels in your hand, that's really what it comes down to is how a camera feels in your hand and if it feels like it's a camera that you can shoot with. And every person is different. Every person's size of their hand and what comfort level they have in terms of how big of a grip they like or how small of a grip they like. The aesthetics of a camera and as well as how well the firmware and their their basically their I.O., how it works for you. Um, sometimes one camera works for one person. It just doesn't work for another person, right? They'll say like, how can any idiot shoot with that camera? And somebody else is like, how can any idiot shoot with that camera? And I'm like, look, I've tested most cameras and I get it. There's a certain feel to certain brands, but you can definitely shoot street. You can shoot street with almost any camera, even if it's something that technically isn't designed for. Because I shot street with the GFX 50S, which you, I didn't say you shouldn't. It wasn't designed for street photography, but you could do it. And I had a lot of fun having these insane 50 megapixel uh, street photos. It was just uh, in Hong Kong and in, in Vancouver. It was a lot of fun doing it. All right, so I'm going to try to answer questions here, guys, to catch up. Any further thoughts on this XF7300, Bill? Yeah, I just I asked Fujifilm to send it back to me. And I guess they only bought one or two as a, as a sample. And so they said it's going to be a while before I get it back. So I'm just waiting for Fujifilm to send it back. So stay tuned for this 70 to 300 part two review. Let me see here. Do you use the Instax printers? Yes, Dan, I do. I have all, all of them. All of them, whatever the ones there are. The, the mini, the Instax, whatever it's called. The small one and then the square. And is there, a, is there one for large? I can't even remember anymore. But I like the square one. But I do use them for sure. Um, not every photo translates well. Like, you know, you can basically print anything that's on your smartphone or on your iPad, send it or directly print, uh, connect it to your camera and send it to the, um, the, the portable Instax printer. Some photos just don't look as good printed. You have to kind of fiddle with it and waste a few shots. Um, but, uh, especially when I'm traveling, which I'm not right now, but cause if I'm not traveling, then I just bring my regular SQ six and just take two pictures. I'll t take one and then give that one and then take a second one and keep for myself. But other than that, if I'm traveling, it is nice to have that printer. And when I'm with, let's say there's like a family dinner or I'm with a friend and I'm having dinner or something and you just want to quickly give them a print instead of just emailing them or texting them a photo you took it's nice to be able to kind of quickly uh print something and give it to them so yeah I, I think they're great i travel with them so they're fantastic 1080p versus 480p 1080p uh, mp asking about getting an x pro 2 but potentially saving for an m8 um, the X-Pro 2's IQ is going to be better than the M8. I mostly do wide urban photography. Do you think Leica IQ is worth the extra investment? Um, not on the not on the Leica M8, to be honest, because on top of that, you got to buy M-mount glass. And so if you're thinking M8 versus X-Pro 2, um, if you said maybe M9, I would say mm, it's the, you know, it's kind of worth it because you're getting the full... Uh, field of view of M mount lenses, but the M8 versus X Pro 2. Personally, I, I would I would go X Pro 2. Um, if you have tons of M glass, then going M8 makes sense. But if you don't have M glass and you're thinking of getting into an M8, it's a huge expense, and you're buying a you know a 10 year old plus body. So I I would say X Pro 2 would make the most financial sense. 
But if you want to follow your heart and kind of be punished in your pocketbook, then I'd say go Leica. It's kind of a gateway into the, the M system, right? Uh, Ali talking about Rico Pentax. They're moving very slow. Yeah, I think Rico, when they bought Pentax, I think they didn't realize what they were getting into. It's like when uh, Adidas bought Reebok. And so I think Adidas should just get rid of Reebok and just sell it off. Um, I think Rico was a profitable company, still are a profitable company because of the business machines and business technology stuff they have. Um, but uh, Pentax is definitely, Rico Pentax definitely struggling because they refuse to go mirrorless. They're still insisting that there is a place in the market for DSLR, which there is a space for, but it's very tiny, and that's the problem. Um, Tom, talking about Lightroom not giving us positive film or high contrast uh, black and white in the drop-down menus. Yeah, I've never been able to make that work for me either. You're right. I just create them all in camera, and then I export, which I often even do with Fujifilm because even with Lightroom, with the Fujifilm, I find that the the uh, classic neg doesn't look as good as when I create classic neg in camera. So I would just do an in camera raw conversion. And right now, because the XE4 is in it's a pre production, uh, Lightroom doesn't even have this XE4 in Lightroom. So I'm only uh, processing the JPEGs. So if there's a really cool picture, I actually do in camera raw to JPEG conversion using my favorite film simulation. The same with the Rico. I just do in-camera raw conversions, which takes more time. It's a bit of a pain, but that's what I do. But yeah, it would be nice if they could do so in Lightroom. But I think it's a matter of Lightroom doing it. I don't think it's a matter of Rico. So I would bug Lightroom. Uh, JH, considering the handling and ergonomics of the XE4 with its flat design and lack of grip, is it really that difficult to handle? When Leica body range would have the same flat non-grip front design for years. Yeah, the thing with Leica, you have to remember though, is that like uh, I don't have any Leicas with me, is that because it's a manual focus camera, you're always holding it like this, right? And they don't have articulating screens, at least the M series. And so you're always shooting this way. So you have like, depending on how you shoot, I'm 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 right left eye dominant, but kind of like your your eye resting against the eyepiece your left hand and your right hand all creates kind of stability, right? And as well as grippage, right? And all the lenses are also reasonably light. I mean, unless you have like a knocked, the reasonably light and compact like I have. And so that's the kind of way you shoot. And also your hand's always here because it has the, at least for me, I'm shooting film like a, you have the, the shutter, uh, the lever here. So when you crank the lever up on any SLR, or rangefinder, you crank it like that, like you saw, you crank it, and then you leave your thumb behind there, right? So now your thumb is kind of, it's, it becomes your thumb grip. So for me, I've never had a problem with my Leica M without a grip, but point and shoots like this, you're, you, tip, you often shoot with an articulating screen, you're often shooting with one hand like this, right? And so I've never taken the grip off. I've never taken the grip, thumb grip, or the front hand grip, off of the XE4, cause it's still, with it on, it's still compact. Like you saw, I, I fit it inside the the, um, uh, the the sling bag from Chrome, the Mini Cadet, and it fits with the front grip and the back grip, which still makes it about the same size as the X100 for me. So um, sure, it's fine without it, but if I were to buy this, I would probably at least get the grip, maybe not necessarily from Fujifilm, I'm sure there'll be third party grips as well, but I do like that it comes with an Arca Swiss dovetail here, so I can just pop this onto a tripod and not have to put a plate on here. It is a nice grip, I do like it, but I wish just, and also there's third party stickers that you can just stick on here, so I think it's worth it, but um, it comes down to, again, your hand size and how you like to shoot and what lenses you're attaching onto it. Someone asking about Margaret asking about the the Sigma DP1. Yeah, I like their their Foveon sensor, the three three uh, stackable sensors, but it has a much lower ISO rating. 
but you're getting basically full frame resolution in an APS-C size sensor, I think it's a really cool technology, honestly. It's just a matter of, it's a proprietary mount on Sigma's camera system and nobody else is gonna make lenses, so you're forced to only buy Sigma lenses. And I think that's the problem. Sigma had the same problem back in the, in the film days is they had their own film camera with their own film mount and they should have asked Nikon or Minolta or Pentax or Canon to say, hey, we'd love to, I mean, they already made mounts in those cameras, but to make their own cameras sharing those mounts. And that's the only real issue with it. But I think it's a really cool technology for sure. Um, Jeff saying the X30 is not touchscreen. It's not touchscreen, eh? I was almost positive it was, but I trust you that it is not. I mean, I don't even just check it. I have a battery here. I thought for sure it was touchscreen. Man, I said that a long time ago too. So I'm still trying to catch up here. But thanks for correcting me. I'm going to put this battery in. I hope the battery's charged. Oh, it's like reset here. Pick the day. Here we go. I guess it's hard to... I believe you, but i almost positive it was touchscreen. But I believe you. Thank you for correcting me. It is not touchscreen. I wish it was touchscreen. If there's an X40... It should, when you want, if this was an X40, they would get rid of the D-pad, 100%, put a joystick here, drop everything. It does actually have a rear dial, which is really cool, but there is no front dial. And it has a custom function button in the front here, and it has that little autofocus select dial, which the XE4 no longer has, but they could have put one that's on the X100, which is on the side here, which, Obviously, it doesn't look as pretty, but I don't see why they thought that that little dial looked ugly here. I don't think it looks ugly. Anyways, but thank you, Jeff, for letting me know. Uh, Razer thought for not to go back to the Rico, but the GR3 is much better than the GXR. Well, in terms of the, the sensor and the firmware, it is. But the GXR is cool because you can get the M-mount sensor... Uh, and put M glass on there, right? And also you can get the uh, the 28 mil equivalent, I think it's an F2.8 or 2.5, or the 50 mil equivalent, and it's a, just a very versatile camera. Um, I, I really like the GXR. If I had a reason to buy it, I would definitely, it's a quirky camera. Like I, I had someone offer it to me to, to for me to buy, but I don't know, it depends what your needs are, but if you want a compact, lightweight, portable, point and shoot, with 24 megapixels and IBIS, then don't get the GXR. Uh, this is Alex. Greetings from the Ukraine. Do you think Fujifilm considered releasing something like an X100V but with medium format sensor? Yeah, you know what? Me and, and Jonas, Jonas Rask, a group of us have been bugging Fujifilm forever. I've been sending pictures to like to Billy, showing him like the the uh, Texas Leica. I've asked him in person um, and saying, hey, like, why don't you make a GFX 100, whatever, I don't know what they're gonna call it, but like the 50R, but with a built-in uh, lens, right? So it'll have to be a, um, it'll have to be a, like a 42 mil or 40, 45 mil, GFX 45 mil built-in, and then make it into a leaf shutter, which would be even more awesome. And it'll have probably like a top shutter speed about one one thousandths or maybe one two thousandths uh, for it. But then you could flash sync up to that top shutter speed. So I think it'd be cool. I've been bugging Fujifilm since 2017 to make a non interchangeable lens GFX uh, range finder uh, type with the hybrid viewfinder for a medium format. I think they would sell well personally. Uh, let me see here. Let me see here. John, don't worry, Taco. Your stream's going well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a hiccup at the beginning, but thanks for you guys for jumping on here again after. Um, uh, Cafe Wavera, Adidas started the process of selling Reebok. Yeah. I kind of feel bad for Reebok because Reebok, remember, they had the NHL and I think they had like the NBA or they had. Um, 
the Olympics or something like that. And as soon as Adidas bought Reebok, they immediately switched it over to the Adidas brand. And then Reebok was kind of left to just kind of make their own stuff, which is always kind of like I've wanted. I, I still go to the uh, Reebok website thinking about buying some of their retro 80s uh, high cut, like the pumps, but not pumps, but that style of their high top basketball sneakers, as well as their classic uh, Reebok with the UK um, uh, logo on there. So I don't mind buying it, but they're not the go-to brand for me. For me, the go-to brand is definitely Adidas, uh, New Balance, and Asics, and Nike to a point, but they're a little bit too cool for school for me. But I do like Nike shoes. Um, what happened to the Lumex 100, LX 100 series? Well, there's a Type 2 that came out, and that's been out for, what, maybe two or three years now? I don't think those subcompacts are selling well. Remember, the LX100 Mark II wasn't much better than the Mark I. That was the problem. It didn't, it was, it was kind of a dud. I actually got the Leica version of it and I was, I liked it because I liked the original LX100, but for the price and for what you got for the price, really wasn't worth it. But if you like the Leica brand, I know some people who love the Leica, they got the, the Leica version of the LX100, and it's still a competent camera. I, it's not like it's a bad camera, but I'd hope they would make it better, like much better for the amount of years it was between the last model. I hope there's gonna be a Mark III, to be honest, but I, like I had mentioned before about the X30, that subcompact market that the RX100 and the G5X Canon and the G7X Canon and the, there's a five, there's a seven, and I think there's a G9X as well, right? That subcompact market is just, just shrinking super fast. People aren't buying those cameras anymore. People would rather just buy a iPhone 12 Pro Max, right? Or a Galaxy Note 10 or whatever. They're buying high-end smartphones and just not buying these high-end point and shoots anymore. And so, and also they're making these 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 ILCs so compact now, or stuff like the X100 are so good now that almost there's almost no point to go to those smaller cameras, sort of ish, a little bit. And one of the exceptions is really this Ricoh GR3 because it uses a large APS-C size sensor, not a one inch sensor or a micro four third sensor, which was in the LX100 series. But yeah, I think it's just kind of a, a tight market there. Uh, Michael Chan asking about the, uh, the Leica X2. I like those series. In fact, I would even buy the Leica, because you know, Leica no longer makes those APS-C all-in-one cameras. I would get an X2 because that sensor, uh, the Tower Jazz sensor that's in there, and their processor and the firmware is really nice. Like, the colors are beautiful. Even the Leica X Vario, which was like hated, but I loved it. It was a weird camera with a super slow, I think it was like a, had a 20, 28 to 60 equivalent zoom or something. It was really weird. And it was an F 3.5 to 6.4, super slow lens, but it was a really sharp, sharp lens, really nice lens. Um, I, if it was me, I think those Leica all-in-one, sort of like an X100 version of their little point and shoots, um, I think those are kind of like modern digital classics. And I think they're kind of going for a, a Decent price now, like like around fifteen hundred dollars or so, and those things were like four thousand maybe or three thousand before. I, I personally would buy it. I think they're cool. I think the the IQ is still really good. I think those are still at about sixteen megapixels or so. I think they're cool. I I, I would personally get the X two if you can if you can find one in good condition and you're happy with the IQ. IQ is good. Tom saying I would buy an X40. I would buy an X42. I love the X30. Yeah, a lot of people seem to like the X30. And a lot of people seem to like the um, X70. I'd love if Olympus made another Pen F. Yeah, we'll see what happens with the Pen series, eh? I am in for a fixed lens leaf shutter GFX100. Yeah, me too. I think that'd be it would sell well for sure. Adidas Superstar, my go-to. Tom, for sure. I think I have at least three of them here in my studio. Um, 
uh, ASO mock saying the same thing. You'd buy a fixed lens GFX 100, 100%. I think it'd be, even if they, even if they made it a 50, meaning if they said, look, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make a GFX 100 all in one. We'll make a GFX 50 all in one. Fine. If they, if that helps using the older, maybe the newer processor, but the older sensor and not throwing an IBIS, but giving you the, the, the electronic view, the, the hybrid viewfinder on the X100, and then they can drop the price to let's say 2,500 to $3,000, go for it. I think it would sell really well personally. And Steve Matthews talking about Sony taking over that one inch sensor point and shoot market. Yeah, cause they just flooded it. They flooded the market with their RX100 series. Uh, do you shoot, this is Steve, do you shoot Minota glass on your Fuji cameras? Yes, I do. If so, do you have a favorite lens to adapt? Um, my favorite lens to adapt are my macro lenses because I actually use my 50 macro and my 100 macro for both product photography as well as for um, uh, duping. I take photos of my negatives using a light table and I use the macro lens, the 50 f2.8 1 to 1. There is a 53.5 1 to 2, which you can't get as close. Which for medium format negs should be fine, but I think for 135 you need the one to one. And um, also I have my beautiful 35 1 4, which works out to be a nice uh, 50 millimeter 1 4 on uh, the Fujifilm system. And I have my 80 to 200. I don't do birding or anything, but it's a beautiful glass and it's kind of a waste on it for me because I don't use it much. I used to use it for sports and weddings, but I don't use that very much. But I would say anything where the crop factor makes sense. So if you have a, a 16 mil lens, it crops to a 24. If you have a 24 mil lens, which I do have, it crops to like a 36. It's not as good, but I have used the 24 as a talking head lens for Minolta. And if you mean Minolta autofocus versus Mania focus, I have both lenses, but a Minolta glass is nice. And you know what? It renders beautifully on the on the Fujifilm or any digital. I know um, uh, Jonas Rask, he did an article on a GFX 50S three years ago, and he adapted a lot of his old Minolta MD glass, including the 45 F2 onto the medium format. And the 45 F2 is tiny and it, it worked. I think it, it showed very little vignetting. This little lens here. He adapted this little lens onto the GFX and either there was either there was no vignetting or almost no vignetting. And look how compact this lens is. It's a 45 F2. I love this lens. They call this a Japanese Sumicron and it's super cheap. Uh, I have two, three copies of these? Three copies of, of this lens here. Um, so yeah, I would definitely do it. The 45 F2 is nice too. It ends up being like um, 60 something or 70 mil lens. Great for portraiture. Uh, do you think there's a case for Fujifilm to make an equivalent Leica MQ monochrome? Yeah, people have been bugging Fujifilm uh, to make a monochrome version of the X100. Um, technically, making a monochrome version of a digital camera is easy because all sensors are monochrome, right? A, a color filter array is basically, so this is your, your sensor layer. There's multiple layers, right? But this is your sensor layer and a color filter array goes on top here. And when light goes through the RGB, uh, they're basically like, think of like just like cellophane, colored cellophane. That's basically what a color filter array is. And when the light hits uh, the red, by the amount of light allowed through, the sensor knows what colors are coming through, right? And those are the three colors, the RGB colors that are the color filter. And if Fujifilm uses the X-Trans, all they need to do is tell Sony, don't put a color filter array, just put the final finishing glass layer on top. And they also would have to adjust the, the, the JPEG firmware conversion to understand what the light is coming through because no longer does it know what color is what, which would be cool if they can, um, yeah, I mean, it comes down to how they would make it black and white, right? If they could do it in software and not remove the color filter array, which would be kind of neat, but it would defeat the purpose of a monochrome sensor, uh, remove the color filter array, adjust the firmware so it can 
realizes it's no longer seeing colors, but it's just looking at different intensities of light and then be able to form an image out of it. I think it'd be pretty awesome. And an X100, uh, X100 monochrome, I think would be cool. Uh, just an hour. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Cafe VR. Since the 27 Mark II is announced, I expect stores to be put the Mark I on clearance if they have stock, Eric, but they should. And if they do put it on clearance, it usually comes from the manufacturer, meaning Fujifilm will give the store a rebate or something like that. Or if Fujifilm is sitting on a whole bunch of them, they would sell them at a rebate to the retailers and then they could sell it at a discount. But optically, it's the same. So the problem with the... The, the original X, the uh, 27 is because there's no front aperture ring and because the new XE4 doesn't have a rear dial, if you're trying to shoot full manual, you're basically using one front dial for everything from shutter speed. I mean, if you want to use dials, you could still have a shutter speed dial on the top, but if you like using quick dial adjustments, because remember this up here is only in full stops. Yeah, it's only in full stop shutter speeds, but if you want to shoot in half or third stops, then you need to use the dials here and there's only one in the front. So, but if you have a camera that has both front, like if you have an XE3, then get the 27 F 2.8 for discount if you want to save the money because optically you're getting the same lens. Imagine the resolution of a monochrome GFX 100S. Yeah, that'd be hilarious. And there you go. I'm caught up. Looky, looky. So I think I'm going to keep it an hour today because I do have to finish my Fuji Love article on the here. I'm going to go back here and maybe share one last time. And someone had said when I shared the screen, what happens is that. Um, here we go. This is the pictures that I took using the. The GF, uh, sorry, the XE4 with the 27, see now the arrows are there, look at that, the arrows are there now. Roland's a nice dude, he's hard to pose. He moves a lot and he turns his head sideways. I thought this was kind of a funny picture here, it's him and his buddy talking there. But this is at F2.8, I can't remember who I focused in on. He looks reasonably sharp, but I think Roland is sharper. Yeah, he's a little sharper. Look at his crazy pants. That's, he made these pants. He uses um, algorithmic, he takes photos and then he creates these algorithms and then he makes these clothes, these pants, which is pretty cool. But let me just kind of scroll through here. I thought this was kind of a funny picture here too. There's this close up of his pants. And this, this is the pictures that I shared on, um, on Instagram. So, you know, like I get them as they're walking in, right? So you get boom, boom, boom. And there was one more picture, but it was out of focus. So boom, boom, boom. And same with this one here. I like this one where you can see the little light. You can see the headlight like a stalking car as he's walking across. And I'm pretty sure he's pretty sharp. Yeah, it's pretty sharp. And then when he walks across, you can now tell that it's a car. So I was thinking about maybe putting these two pictures side by side. Another picture of someone walking across here like that. Um, just thought the lights on the building look pretty cool here, but these are all taken with the XE4 and the 27, uh, 27 F 28. Other than these two pictures here that I showed you that I switched over to the 35 F2 because I wanted better IQ. Uh, maybe the thing has come back up again. The, um, here we go. See, remember before I showed you guys, none of this XF information was here. This is the 35 F2, F2 at 170. So I kept it at ISO 1600 and I got a 70th of a second. And that makes a huge difference when you're trying to get a shot and keep everything in focus, right? And then here is a shot that I took with the 27 F2.8 at ISO 1600. I'm at 135th of a second and as you can see, he's blurry, right? He's blurry. And then the shot before, this might also be blurry. Let me just check here. Also blurry. And this was shot at 1 35th of a second. And then this shot just before here, 1 35th of a second. This one, he's sharp. See that? 
and it's not as sharp as the 35 f2 as you saw if you remember this shot here that i took of tj this is a much sharper image you can see the detail i mean maybe you can't see it because it's a 1080 but you could see the details of his eyebrows there and you can almost count the eyelashes right over there so if you're doing indoor type low light photography which i do a lot of um i i um like stuff like this like i took this of camera girl outdoor here stuff like this and i shot this at f what was that at? f 27 f 2.8 i was at f 2.8 and uh really sharp and from a distance that i'm at from camera girl she's sharp you could see the little hairs on the on her jacket there right you can see her little fluvog boots here it's an it's a nice lens for outdoor type uh street photography from from a long distance but as you start doing these close-up shots like this it's not as sharp you can see that the you can see like right here it's a little blurry right you can't read the buttons there right and we're at what are we at here at a 90th of a second at iso 1600 and i still couldn't get a sharp image now 100 percent if i had the 35 f2 I would have got a sharp image. And this one, I just happened to to get a really sharp image of Camera Girl here. And this was indoor. See, I was at 1 300th of a second. And that's why this photo turned out, right? So um, that's kind of my conclusion. And that's what I'm going to write on my Fuji Love article. That uh, for outdoor, um, when the lighting is good, I really love this series too of this old couple here walking across. Just kind of stood there. I love his hand, but I don't like, you can see the wife's hat there. If she wasn't there, I love his posture. I love his hand gesture. And then you can sort of, I still, now they're separated, which is kind of nice. And then you can see he kind of notices me there, which is kind of cool. And he's nice and sharp. See that? He's not really looking right at me, but he's probably wondering why is he doing this standing there. And now I like the way his jacket is open here. And I also like that the previous shot, the two shots, see how you can see the green and the bag is flat? I don't like that look. I like how it straightens out. And I just like his feet. And I love how his jacket is open. And then finally, they're getting here. And then as they're passing, his jacket wide open like that. And the wife looks backwards. I like these two shots. I'm just trying to decide which of these pictures I'm going to use for... I actually do like this shot as well. And I like his hand posture here. I love the way his hands are. But I don't like how his wife is a little bit too hidden. So he's pretty sharp too. And I think I was at F... Where am I at here? I'm at F5. So I did stop down a little bit. Because I, I didn't want them to be out of focus. Or the camera to accidentally focus on this uh, light pole here. So I'm at F5. But there's reasonable, reasonably good separation and pop. Because it's so dark here. It's so dark here. And you get this really great sideways light so they do pop even at f5 but i'm just trying to decide i think i'm going to pick when you see the fuji love article you probably see either this this or this one of these three pictures is going to be picked for my fuji love article and there's a couple of other cool shots that i got um let me see here these ones here i really like these shots as well uh it just works out well the frame with these lights and you get these crazy shadows so it just made sense for me to stand by these things so you can sort of see that as he walks across. And I like these two shots as well. And I got this. This is not as good because you can't see her face. But I did like kind of like you see her little Gucci purse. And then you see her, her I don't know what kicks she's wearing. Though. What is that? Some kind of fancy pants kicks there. But anyways, I thought I would just show you. And this fella, he was cool. He worked for the... Um, I think his name is Chris or Ken. He works for the uh, Vancouver Fraser Health, Coastal Health. And he's a nurse or something like that or a doctor. And these are the night shots that I took. That I think I shared one of them on Instagram or Twitter. And you could see how I'm at ISO 3200 at f2.8 with the 27mm lens. I'm at 1 35th of a second. So the only thing that can be in focus is really this front light. And everything else is a little bit blurry and the bus is blurry, which is fine. But I mean, I'm really stuck at a 35th of a second. That's because the bus is coming, that the light went up a little bit to a 35th of a second. So this is not a nice low light shooter. If I had the X, uh, the the Ricoh GR, I would have taken killer shots. Because not only is that a wider lens, I would have been a foot closer to these cars. I would have been at f2.8, greater depth of field, and 
much a much sharper image. So I um when it comes to low light photography, the XF27 is an ixnay for me. So thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna just double check one last time for any questions here, guys. How did that bus fit down? Yeah, that's the funny thing. That's you know what street I'm talking about, right? Cafe YVR. Um, Dom said that the buses have torn off his his uh, mirrors multiple times. It's, it's the 134 bus. The the bus hits mirrors, not just his cars, but the neighbors' cars, and they've been um, complaining to um, the coastal. The uh, trans, whatever, B not BC Transit, whatever they're called, Coast Mountain, that wa stop moving these huge buses through our little back streets here. Uh, but they, yeah, they do kind of fit in there. Um, nice set. And let me see here. I'm just trying to see if I'm missing any questions. Uh, that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. I'm going to uh, click out and we will see you next week because today is the last day of the week, not the beginning of a new week, right? So thanks for watching and happy. And then and also if I missed your question, once this video is uploaded, then you can leave questions down below and I'll try to answer them, right? So thanks for watching and happy shooting. Peace.